Hello and welcome to another edition of Turned Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham. Once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but out of the life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, huge guests, huge guests, the legend from the Lookouts, from the label Lookout Records, from the zine Lookout, Larry Livermore is here. And if you think this is going to be one of those interviews where I ask him a bunch of questions about Green Day and we end up talking about Operation Ivy for the whole time, uh, we talk about that, but don't worry. that That's not the, the gist of this thing. This one's a hot one. This one's a hot one. More on that in one second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedoutapunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire. But this week, there was a... There was an assist on this play, um, and he will get the message to me. But f- you can also find me on various forms of social media at left for damien If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling all of your friends about him, letting everyone you know know about this podcast that we do here, that we do twice a week. And, and yeah, you can do it that way. You can also support the show by uh, subscribing to it and rating it on iTunes or wherever you do listen to this thing. Uh, and you could also head over to patreon.com slash turned out of punk. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that does do that and check out some of the stuff we do over there and, uh, support the show that way. And speaking of support, this thing would not be possible without the kind support of the fine folks at Vans who came aboard, got three years ago now, two years ago, two, two plus years ago now and getting more than two plus years ago now. Uh, and they said, Damien, do what you do, but just don't do it in your own pocket. And they helped me cover the cost of this thing, which is hugely hugely appreciated so thank you to vans for that and uh yeah i I long for the house of vans to return check out some of the stuff they're doing over there at channel 66 and uh and yeah oh my gosh can't wait to get back on the road and speaking of getting back on the road uh fucked up is going to be going on tour with faith no more for a few shows in september and then we're going to be going out for our own david comes to life tour Going around places, the dates for the East Coast have been announced, and more dates are coming, including dates for the UK, and and more 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 down the line. And, and also, I think we're going to Ireland on that too. You know, UK and Ireland. All right, that is uh, that for fucked up. Oh, head over to MatadorRecords.com and check out the uh, fucked up re uh, issues for David Comes to Life, and head over to TankCrimes.com. TankCrimeRecords.com, I believe. Sorry, Scotty. And check out the uh, Year of the Horse vinyl, which I believe there's another pressing of that's gone up for sale. Okay. Anyway, on to today's show. Today on the show, Larry Livermore is here. Oh, man, I've been burning the midnight oil to try and get this to you because uh, I'm very excited for you to hear it. This is a interview with a legend. You know, I don't think this guy needs any sort of real introduction. Um, you know, he is someone that, you know, founded Lookout Records, has also played in a lot of bands. I think his bands kind of get overlooked. You know, I think the Lookouts are a fantastic punk band. The Potato Men are great, too. But it, people definitely tend to focus on the fact that he is involved in putting out some of the most important punk records to kind of come out of the late 80s into the early 90s. Some of my favorites, at least, you know, and, and bands and that would go on to become pillars of music. You know, you can't get too much bigger than Green Day and you can't get too much more respected than Neurosis. Uh, but, you know, and, and then he left the label and the label kind of had some problems and then ultimately fell apart. But anyway, this is a conversation that I thought we we're going to go, you know, a couple different places with. You'll, you'll hear in the beginning, I thought we we're going to be talking a lot about weed. Um, but we go a lot of other places. Larry has lived an incredible life in music. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, spoil it for you. This is going to get real good. He also has two fantastic books, Spy Rock Memories, as well as How to Run Slash Ruin a Record Label. Both are available on the fantastic Don Giovanni Records, and I strongly recommend reading both of them. Uh, I believe they're still maybe tracking down physical ones might be hard, but I, I think they both are available on, you know, the digital platforms to read books. Uh, but fantastic books, well worth your time reading. And, you know, Larry's got a couple more books in them, judging from this episode. All right, I'm not going to yammer on anymore. Also, huge thank you to my friend, 
David from the South Bronx, one of my favorite faces to see whenever I'm out in New York playing shows uh, for making this happen. They really kind of have been pushing for this to happen for a while and telling Larry to make this happen for a while. And so huge thank you to David for this. Also, check out David's new Japanese text project. Uh, oh, you can hear it on japanesetext.bandcamp.com. And uh, the only real note to get to is later on in the episode, I talk about the Process Church being referenced on the first Parliament record. I was talking out of my ass. Of course, it's the third and fourth Funkadelic record that referenced the Process Church. It'll make sense when you hear it. All right. But that, that is it, I think, for notes. Uh, so anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy Larry Livermore on Turned Out a Pop. <laughs> Larry, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're very cordial and uh, and genial, and uh, I thank you for for asking me. This is a great honor to be on such a prestigious show. Well, I that you know fills my bucket to hear you say because not only am I like a massive fan of you know the label that you do, but I'm a massive fan of the music that you've done, the zine that you've done. And then as I was just telling you off air, here I am one night watching a documentary that I think is going to be about murder and cannabis while smoking some cannabis myself. And then here comes one of my favorite <laughs> punk personalities talking about the history of cannabis in Northern California. And I just I just had to jump at the chance at having you on the show. So thank you for being here. Well, you think you're surprised when they recruited me for that show. They never bothered telling me anything about Sasquatch. <laughs> uh, I was given the impression that they wanted me sort of as a to give a historical background to the area and that, that the whole point of the show was to study how the marijuana economy had changed the, the culture up there, which it did dramatically. And then all through the recording, they flew up from Hollywood and set up a huge, huge crew in my living room. And then all through the recording, they got, and what about Sasquatch? How many Sasquatches did you see? I'm, I'm like, what? <laughs> See, if they knew anything about the area, they would know that Sasquatch hangs out in the redwoods down in the valleys uh, and where all of us hippies and punks lived was up on the mountaintop where it's very dry. Sasquatch wouldn't come there anyway, even if he was looking for trouble. And if I was in that area, I would not be looking for Sasquatch. I would be looking for the hippies up on that mountain growing that, that good, that, that incredible sounding cannabis. Well, the thing is, times have changed, and uh, it's not all peace and love up in those mountains anymore, uh, unfortunately. And that's one of the things I was talking to on the to, on the local radio station there earlier today. Uh, a lot of a lot of gunfire. I mean, that's America, but that's the Wild West too. And um, it's a real, it's kind of a real crisis. It's it's I, I compared it to like. You know, for years and years and years, everybody says, oh, we got to legalize marijuana. And um, and now it's kind of like the dog that caught the car, was chasing the car and caught it. What does he do with it? Um, because mm -hmm. nobody seems to quite know how to administer the whole issue. And so it's been a bit chaotic. I was, uh, I was just reading actually recently that uh, Quebec or Montreal, I'm not sure if it's the city or the whole province, passed some new laws about regulating marijuana use, not not about not making it illegal again, but just regulating it because there had been conflicts with, you know, not everybody wanted to smell it or see it. Uh, and so some of the, the really hardcore marijuana people were angry, like, oh, how dare you take away our rights? And other people were saying, no, you got to, you know, live and let live. You know, when they leak, my, my dad told me, my dad grew up during Prohibition, and when you know, he told me how when they... Uh, legalized alcohol after a long time of it being illegal in Amer in America that at first a lot of the people had gotten used to making or importing their own booze and they didn't want to go through the state liquor stores and so on so it took a while to get them to to have regulations and get it sort of into an orderly fashion and um, eventually they did but you know with marijuana the way it's been handled up in California they kind of just sort of said, okay, well, you know, after, after spending half the century trying to lock everybody up and steal, steal every, all their land and money, now all of a sudden the gates are wide open, do whatever you want. And, you know, both extremes are a little problematic. 
Well, I don't know. Like, I, I, I just think the picture that you paint and also the picture I've seen painted before, it seems like the government criminalizing it is really what fucks it up. Like when it's a bunch of hippies growing it up on the mountain and, and, you know, selling it for small profit, you know, and it really isn't a that big of a problem. It's only when, you know, you have the police coming in and then you talk about in the documentary, the distrust really starts coming in and everyone starts, the guns come in. Well, there was always guns up there, and that's because there's no. I'm not. I'm not saying because it was. It was not a violent place. In fact, for the last 20 years I lived there, I never even had a, had a lock on my door. It just it broke, and I never fixed it, and I never felt like I needed it. Um, but if you do have any problems, it's like an hour and a half to the nearest sheriff station, and and that and that one sheriff is covering like hundreds of square miles or kilometers, uh, if you prefer. Um, so most people did have a gun, you know, also more than human problems, it would be animal problems. Mm -hmm. uh, there's bears, there's mountain lions. Uh, Potentially and, Sasquatch. And well, nobody I know ever shot a Sasquatch, but um, quite a few people shot, shot uh, animals for food too, yeah. especially when things were were, were lean up there. The rattlesnakes were always a problem. Uh, rabid skunks and raccoons that uh, needed to be dispatched. It was more that when you say the government, I mean, marijuana had been illegal for a, a long time, uh, since the 30s. And the scene up there was pretty halcyon and idyllic for a number of years. But I, I suppose it couldn't stay like that. I, in my book, I write about how the I think it was the year, I was either the 1982 or 1983, there had been almost no police raids. Everything had just been, you know, kind of a really easy going year. And people were starting to say, I guess the police have given up, so we don't need to worry anymore. And then the next year they came in with giant Vietnam era helicopters hmm. and just really tore the hell out of the place. And everything did change, um, it, not all at once. And that, we were talking about that earlier. What happened was that because they wiped out so many farmers, then the price went up sky high, doubled or tripled. And then of course, people were motivated to put in a lot more, but if you put in too much, then they could spot you from the air. And um, some people that got wiped out said, well, it's easier just to go steal somebody else's than to grow my own now because it's so stressful. And um, probably the worst thing that happened was that people started growing it indoors. So, you know, if you, they would build little houses and grow it inside so you couldn't see it from the air. But because we were off the grid, they had to run diesel generators day and night, which led to forest fires, which led to making it feel like you were living in a truck stop instead of a perfectly peaceful, organic kind of environment. My first few years up there, I could not see a single other light from, from my house, looking out over hundreds of, well, hundred, probably you know, 50, 100 miles of virgin land. I could not see sign, any, another sign of human habitation. And then suddenly there's these powerful generators that sound basically like a semi-truck idling outside your door. Yeah. And that changed the climate in another way in that when everybody was growing out in the woods, then nobody, if you, a thief or the police would not know where to come to look for. They would have to hunt through all sorts of obstacles. And it was very rough terrain. Uh, but once it was all indoors in one place, then the thieves knew exactly where to go. And so the grower would be very paranoid and he would sit there with his shotgun just in case somebody tried to come through the door. And, you know, that gets pretty boring. So he might start getting high on some cocaine or amphetamine to pass away the hours. And then he'd be like super tense and shoot anything that moved and, uh, and just didn't feel like free to, uh, to, to leave his, his home. Yeah. Uh, and I, I tell a story in my book about this one guy who was on, set out to be one of the biggest successes. He built this whole underground chamber under his house. It was as big as his house and he had a big house, um, just like multi rooms buried underneath and was cranking out a million or 2 million bucks a year worth of, of marijuana. 
by by generator power, but for years at a time he couldn't. He felt like he couldn't leave the house, so he would just sit there get, taking drugs till his heart finally gave out, and he like died on the floor, surrounded by like a fortune in, in marijuana. Yeah. Yep. It was like a kind of an allegory of some sort and, and very sad, but that kind of summed up how the culture changed from these kind of sort of guerrilla romantic uh, back to the land farmers like creeping around in the woods and planting their little seeds here and there to where it became an industry. And it's this all took place what I'm talking about back in the 80s. Um, yep. It's it's proceeded a lot farther down along those lines now it will it, it really it's amazing when you look at obviously all of the narco war but like if you look at specifically cannabis and just the way in canada um especially too and also the west coast of the united states like how much it shapes policy how much it shapes just just culture like these this plant and the criminalization of this plant and the criminalization of the people that were around this plant really you know gives birth to so much counterculture um good and bad yeah but there was a basic conundrum which we all used to all talk about all the time back in the 80s like people would the farmers and the local uh, back to the landers would sit around but we had it was a it was an easy life back in those days it, um uh, we had a lot of time just to hang out and talk and uh speculate and philosophize and one of the ongoing conundrums was that, well, it would be good to legalize this stuff so that we wouldn't all be so stressed out. Uh, and, and at the same time, um, people would point out, but if you did, then you wouldn't be making this money. All the money goes. Yes. <laughs> and that's basically what they're wrestling with now is the because everybody can grow it, the price has plummeted. And, mm -hmm. and so it's a vicious circle. People need to instead of you know it used to be they would double their crop now they're quadrupling quintupling it i mean they're planting it like cornfields basically and and mass producing it mm -hmm. um now i'm i'm not a connoisseur of the drug myself i don't think anybody should be put in jail for using it but at the same time i uh, i i put in 26 or 27 hard years of, of smoking it regularly it's been many years since i touched it now but by the same token, I don't want to. I don't want to see anybody locked up for 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 smoking it. Um, and I don't. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. It's a, it's a really it's a it's a it's a question that I mean. I mean, if it were, if I were suddenly the president or the prime minister, I would. I guess my approach would be to to regulate it more or less like uh, alcohol is that people that wanted it could get it and that nobody was going to get shot or killed or put in prison for producing it. But that would mean telling a whole lot of people, no, you can't be running these industrial level farms anymore. And that would, uh, that would lead to a lot of problems. Well, I, I honestly think like you look at uh, Oregon, and where Oregon, I think, really kind of succeeded was the fact that they allowed people to grow their own by giving people grow rights. And they also handed out a ton of licenses to different companies. So it dropped the price down. But there was also like there is a market for someone that's going to spend a ridiculous amount of money on this stuff, like a connoisseur market. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. And that's what I was talking about with the uh, people that run the radio show up there in, in uh, Humboldt. Uh, to, to me, yeah, I think that's the only way that that people are going to be able to continue to make a living indefinitely is through like the super gourmet uh, kind of serve varieties. It, it's a, it's a lot like wine, and uh, just to the south of where I used to live is a, is a pretty famous wine district, and it's the same kind of deal. There's a, no end of, of rock gut cheap wine that you can yeah. as well get drunk, yeah. and you can turn that out of any factory. But there's, you know, s certain small vineyards where they produce stuff that's $200, $300 a bottle. And to people who are into that kind of stuff, they, they'll, they'll gladly pay it. Um, I, you know, as I say, I gave up marijuana a long time ago, but, and I, 
But during all the years I lived there, I got used to, you know, it was not, it was no big deal. You didn't ever, ever have to pay for it. I, it was just always top of the line. Just, you know, sometimes you get sick of looking at it. You're, the kinds of stuff that people in the city would say, oh, my God, that's a fortune. I'd pay anything for that beautiful marijuana. And we'd be like, oh, geez, yeah, here's another sack of it. <laughs> um, it's powerful stuff. That's another thing that I think you, you seem like a, a younger man. Um, but when I started in the 1960s, the marijuana was like very, very mild compared to what it is now. Uh, it, or, or what it even became by the 70s or 80s, it was it would just give you a kind of, you know, it, would, it did its job, but it was mostly imported from, from Mexico and Colombia. And the first time I encountered the homegrown stuff was a late, late 70s, not long before I moved up there to the country. And I, I should say, I did not move up to the country to be a marijuana grower. I, it's the last thing on my mind. In fact, I was determined not to. I, I moved to the country, to the mountains, because I was sick of the city and the punk scene. And I said, I'm done with it. I'm going to go off in the wilderness and start my own civilization. And I had saved up a little bit of money. So I thought, you know, well, at least I don't have to grow marijuana like all those other people. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't for uh, for a couple of years, first few years. Well, a couple of years, first couple of years, I didn't. And I kind of thought I was Mr. Big Stuff because... I, I was not like the rest of them, and they thought I had short hair and I would listen to that weird music, so they kind of were a little dubious about me too. But I had not, in my smart calculations, I had not figured that, you know, the money I had saved up was not going to last indefinitely. And in fact, it lasted a lot less time than I thought it would because country living can be expensive, and, you know. When you got to go 45 miles to the nearest store, for example, or 10 miles to the nearest paved road or our phone booth to make a phone call, a lot of gasoline, a lot of, uh, you know, have when, when you got to get all your own wood, you, you need a chainsaw, you need, when you have to ride over those washboard roads, your truck breaks down all the time. It was, uh, yeah, so I found myself not long before the whole lookout uh, and punk rock adventure or lookouts and lookout records adventure began. <clears throat> Excuse me, I found myself totally broke for for a brief period, and it was scary. It was very. I had not been broke since the '60s when, um, you know, all of a sudden it's a lot different being broke in the city mm. where you know a lot of people and stuff, and being broke up on a mountain where, you know, whether you can come up with a couple dollars makes the difference of whether you can buy enough gas to go to town to take care of the simplest errands. Mm -hmm. I was even start, I'm not a hunter and never have been, but I was even starting to look at the wild turkeys and stuff and wondering if I could figure out how to shoot them and cook them. But they were, they were smarter than I was. <laughs> I swear to God, it was the, it's the damnedest thing. I still can't get over this, but I had two, two dogs and uh, six cats and Every morning I would go walk up to the top of the land and back down again, and they would all follow along after me. And this flock of wild turkeys started living on land, and they would follow along <laughs> too. And this had been going on for six months or a year. And one day I said, well, you know what? And I like the turkeys, but I think maybe I'm going to have to sacrifice one of them because I'm getting hungry. And so this one morning I brought out the gun <laughs> for the walk. And they all just took off. Like how, I don't know how they knew that it wasn't just a stick or something. And they flew across the canyon and took up residence on somebody's land on the other side of the canyon. And I could still see them like just little dots walking up and down the edge of the canyon. And they never came back, never set foot on my land again. And I felt kind of bad because not everybody had a flock of wild turkeys on their land. In fact, I'd been there a few years already before they showed up. Uh, at any rate, long way around, I, uh, at that at that point, I did have to try to learn how to grow marijuana, and it kept me going for a couple of years. And um, a lot of people like to spread the rumor or the story or whatever that Lookout was started with marijuana money. That That is not true. Um, it did keep me alive long enough so that I could start Lookout. But, but by the time uh, we started the record label, 
Um, my, my finances had recovered a little bit, and it was started on a shoestring of, of $4,000, which still was quite a bit of money back in 1987. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I was very determined to, to keep the marijuana out of, out of it because, well, you know, did you ever see the NWA documentary, Straight Outta Compton? Yep. Yeah, they, they got the drugs and the, and the record business and the music all mixed up and it leads to problems. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, it's even, even like other punk bands that have been on the show um had had management that was involved in selling drugs or had you know oh, yeah other people, you know well, like, I, I don't know if, i can't swear to god that this is true but it was well understood back in uh the 70s uh, among the underground people like that the uh money that elected jimmy carter in 1976 came through in large part through the allman brothers and their record company which was basically cocaine even though even though uh, jimmy carter himself is a born again fellow and i i'd be surprised to hear he was ever involved in drugs although you never know uh but that was could be just a rumor but that's what everybody thought at at the time it was like oh yeah the underground has elected a president now yeah well it's, it's not even like a secret on on the show like in a lot of cases like a lot of people have come on and kind of said or alluded to the fact that like yeah, we were poor kids. The only way we could have afforded to do what we did as a band was because we were selling drugs. Like, don't like. Well, I was lucky. Um, I've been lucky a lot of times. Uh, not always. I've had some bad stuff happen. But my basic luck was that some of the stupidest and worst things that I ever did somehow <laughs> turned out advantageous to me. And I will give you just two examples, both of which are connected to how I was finally able to get on my feet and do something. Um, back in 1966, I, uh, I was kind of a disturbed mm -hmm. teenager, let's put it that way. And I, uh, I set fire to my university multiple times, as a matter of fact, cause it didn't, it was mostly uh, cinder block. It didn't burn well. What was the plan? Um, why? Just because. Uh... Why? Well, I tell you what I had, I had been kicked out of university the year before for drinking mm. on campus and lost my scholarship as a result. Well, I was from a relatively poor family, so we, we couldn't have afforded to pay tuition on our own. So I lost my scholarship and was kicked out. So when I came back, my father said, as I, and I respect him for this, that, okay, I borrowed money and sacrificed to get you off to college and you blew it. So you're on your own from now on. You want to go to college, you're paying your own way. So I went to work in the auto factory in the summer, and during the year I had to work in the student union, cleaning up after the other students and bussing their tables and dish dishwashing that kind of stuff. It's okay; it wasn't that hard of work. But they brought in now. Don't want to get personal here, but they brought in this new boss, and his name was Beaver, and he was from Canada, and he was about four foot eight. I maybe four foot <laughs> ten at the most. He, his apron went all the way down to the floor. Yeah, and I don't know if his name Beaver had referred to Canada specifically, or because he worked like a busy beaver, or both. Okay. Yeah, it was like the most enthusiastic guy in the world ever. I mean, he was like, "We're going to have the best bus boys and the best dishwashers and the best student union spotless." And suddenly, and from going having a very easy going job, which paid a dollar an hour, by the way, so not as yeah. you know, and we could eat all the free food we wanted. Suddenly, we could not have any free food. We had to never stop working the whole time, and so that was what I was mad about. I was I was literally furious. I was going to show them. I was going to destroy the system, and it's like a detective thriller. This went on for seven weeks, <laughs> and the new police officer on the local force, the first African-American police officer they did, they'd ever had. Uh, very nice guy. And he was always arresting me for one thing or another, but he was always, he would say, your mom and dad, your mom and daddy must be so proud of you for going to university. Why are you letting them down like this? Yeah. And, and I'd say, I'll try to do better. But he finally caught pinned this on me. And he said, well, I can't help you now. You probably have to go to prison. 
And did you have to go to prison? Came close, but instead they turned it into a psychiatric case. Okay. And this was in the middle of the Vietnam War. So next thing I know, I get my draft notice because I'm out of school again. Yeah. And then they find out, oh, he's nuts. He, he tries to burn down buildings. And, you know, I would have thought, well, perfect for Vietnam. They were burning down everything over there. But nope, I got rejected. So I didn't have to go to Vietnam. And the second half of the, the blessing was that they put me on uh, welfare for the insane. <laughs> and, and that would last for another 20 years. Okay, so that's where the money came from for the lookout. Basically, yes, because <laughs> I was insane. <laughs> well, that yeah. is a that is definitely like you know, sell drugs or be insane. You got to do one to get into this record business. Well, but in San Francisco, there was a huge art scene. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you ever heard of a group called the Coquettes. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. Yeah, they. Uh, we used to know a lot of them, and in fact, uh, my first house in San Francisco had been their house. I took moved in because they couldn't pay the rent and just became became our house. Um, but almost all of them funded their art by ATD. Uh, it was they. It was it stood for Aid to the Totally Disabled, but they all called it Aid to the Totally Damaged. Mm -hmm. And. Um, there's that. There's this whole music and art scene that never would have happened if it weren't for. It was kind of like a government subsidy for the arts, and <laughs> I did, was not even looking for it. I just uh, I, I had to go see the shrink because of the of the conditions of my not getting sent to prison, and I was like crying one day because I don't know what's going to be become of me because I I can never hold on to a job. I can't do anything right. I can't stay in school. And he signed me up for this program, and then uh, I, I didn't think that much about it. And uh, a few months later, I opened the mail, and there's a, a check for a lot of money because they paid they paid me uh, back pay for all of the the couple of years before. Oh, beforehand too. Um, yeah, it was the thing is after uh, is kind of a touching moment, and it really informs my feelings about government and society, which. I know a lot of punks are supposed to be, I hate society, I want to destroy the government, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, the lookout office in the 90s was located next door to the Social Security office, which I don't know if they call it something different in Canada, but uh, Social Security is mostly known in the U.S. for, for pensions for old, uh, elderly people, but it also pays money to disabled people, people mm -hmm. are not able to work. And... I had reached a point where Lookout was making enough of a profit that I could not only hire a couple of employees, but also pay myself a salary, a minimal salary. My rent was only a hundred bucks a month. So I, by law and by conscience, I had to go into the social security office, social security office and tell them, well, I don't, I'm making money now. I have, I, I have a job and making money and I don't need your payments anymore. And they, they were, these ladies were so nice and they thought, I had gone crazy because why would I be turning down free money? And I said, well, no, I'm, I'm making these records and they're selling a whole bunch and I'm actually making a lot of money. And they said, are you sure? <laughs> and, and, and I said, I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'd like to keep getting free money, but I think it would both, both be illegal and immoral. And they said, well, we'll put you on the special program. You, you get nine months, month, nine more months to try out <laughs> your, your, your little business here. And, if you're still going, if you're still in business at the end of the nine months, we'll stop your, your payments. And I said, well, okay, you don't have to, but okay. And sure enough, at the end of nine months, Lookout was doing even better. And I went back and said, yeah, we're, we're doing fine. I don't really need this money anymore. And I, I, I literally broke down and started crying because, you know, even though these ladies obviously were not the people who had given, put me on the program a long time before, but just that they were working there. And I said, thank you so much for giving me this breathing space in my life, this chance to, I, I got to study, I got to travel, I got to learn, and I got to do something that I dreamed of, and all because you gave me a chance. And thank you so much, and I hope you give that same opportunity to others. And if I ever make enough money to pay taxes, which I did end up mm -hmm. doing, 
I hope that you use it to help other people the same way you helped me. And they, they looked at me like they kind of rolled their eye, like this guy's like, maybe this guy still is crazy, but at the same time, they smiled too and said, you bless your heart and you go have a good life and uh, you come back if you need help again. That is a beautiful story. And that, and it also, I think, highlights like the difference, I guess, in states, right? Because like you hear stories about, like I guess famously Rocky Erickson, right? Goes, he gets a drug charge and goes into the institution and, and never comes out. I'm sorry, who? A Rocky, Rocky Erickson from the 30 Floor Elevators. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was happened quite a few years earlier, didn't it? I think that was in 68. Yeah, um, I was, my life could have gone a number of directions. I got in trouble with the authorities back then too and had, to, that's the other half of my, um, what could have gone horribly wrong and ended up being not so bad, actually pretty good was that I got in trouble for marijuana back in the late 60s. Mm. And that they were going to put me in prison for that too. Yeah. And that was the law. You might have heard of John Sinclair. the fellow. Yeah, absolutely. For MC5. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was in prison for 10, sentenced to 10 years. They were going to give me 20. <laughs> and wow. It was the minimum for what I had done. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'm 20 years old. I'm not. That will be that, you know, 20 years. I'll come out. I'll be 40 years old. I might, my life will be over. That's, That's your life. Yeah. So I went, as they called it back then, underground, spent a year hiding out, um, had a lot of adventures. This was the year that there was supposed to be a revolution and the whole society was going to come apart. And I figured, you know, I, if I just stay loose for a year or two, you know, the revolution will be here. There will be no more government. I won't have to worry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> come out. So it was a hard year and especially hard on my parents who had no idea where I was and didn't even know I was in trouble until the police came busting in their front door in the, in the suburbs with, with guns. Mm. And my parents are very sedate people or were until that moment. Meanwhile, I'm out uh, first in New York City living in an abandoned warehouse and then hiding, living in a tree house in Ohio and then it eventually made it to California. And it seems like a small thing, but that's that changed my whole life, you know, getting to see California and realize that there was a place that I, I belonged more than the car factory or the jail or the insane asylum. And um, so I couldn't wait to get back there. And I did spend much of my early adult life in California that it was probably at that time, you know, things are different now, but at that time it was probably the only place in America that I could have lived. Were, were like growing up, what kind of music were you into around like during this sort of period in your life? Um, uh, 90s music that's a joke, but no, <laughs> that's that some futuristic shit. Eight, 1890s music. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm, I'm not joking, I'm totally serious. Okay, yeah, my uh, because my, my family tends to, to marry late, and so there we had links to people, yeah, you know, there was a lot of people in my families, or you know, my aunts and uncles, and so on. And grandparents who came back who were born in the 1870s and 1880s okay and so my parents especially my dad grew up listening to the music of the 1890s which was actually a huge flowering for popular music in america virtually the invention of popular music because it was the first time that working people ordinary blue collar people had enough disposable income to to decide for themselves and buy their own music instead of just having it fed to them. And so there was this big flowering of songwriting and very uh, melodic and chorus laden and often very humorous. My dad would sing the songs around the house. And then one day it occurred to me, I said, Dad, how did you have hit songs back when you were a boy when there was no radio stations and there was no record players yet? You know, there, were, there were record players, but only for rich people. And, um, and he said, oh, well, every Friday afternoon, we would all go down to the Five and Dime store and uh, they would have the sheet music would come in from New York with the new hits and we mm -hmm. would get it. And, and somebody on every block had a piano, so they would take it home and learn how to play it. And then Friday night, we'd all come around their house and, and they'd play the new hits and we'd sing them. And <laughs> that was it's a, 
Well, it's amazing when you think about how like music has gone from being a communal thing to gradually such a personal thing where like at one point you had to go to a concert hall or then you had to get the sheet music and the groups go from smaller to smaller until eventually it's just you by yourself with your playlist. Well, I think it comes, I think it comes and goes and it continues to mutate because my dad also told me, you know, when the first radio station started broadcasting, he was still a boy and he built himself a crystal radio set up in his attic where he could listen to it, but only on a headphone. So it was a very personal thing. His parents were not interested in listening to this newfangled <laughs> contraption. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was basically the 1920s equivalent of a, of a early internet nerd, you know. <laughs> yeah. In fact, when the internet, my dad was still around when the internet came and, and he was asking me like, what on heck are you doing with that? And I, you know, he, he would say, my day, we had all these inventions that changed the world, like airplanes and radio and television. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I said, well, we've got the Internet. And he said, you're just typing on a, it's just a glorified electric typewriter. What is that going to do? <laughs> <laughs> but to continue with the music thing, uh, my mu- uh, that was my first influence. The other big first influence was musical comedies, which my parents were real into and they started they used to they didn't couldn't afford to go to the theater but they ushered at the local theater to for so they could see the plays for free when they came through okay so yeah. they started taking me when i was still quite young and so i saw all these great musical comedies uh, and again that kind of informed informed my taste when it came to music many years later the whole melodic pop pop punk kind of thing mm-hmm. I always loved a good chorus and then about 1954, uh, I used to sit there, you know, we didn't have a television yet, but I would sit there by the family radio, which was about the size of a, a, a television, you know, huge. And I would lean against it and twirl the dial back and forth looking for something interesting. And one, one day I heard a, a doo-wop song. I think it might have been Earth Angel by the Penguins or it might have been something by a group called the Cordettes. But it just, it was magic. It was I mean, I liked a lot of music. I liked Patty Page, How Much Is That Dog in the Window, but this was something beyond. It was coming from another planet. And so doo became my thing for a long time. Uh, later on, at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, I became a, a greaser and with my leather jacket and my uh, um, slick back hair and my pointy shoes. And our gang, that's what we listened to was doo wop. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't even. It's a funny thing. I because they didn't usually have pictures. We didn't know at that time that most of the doo wop we were listening to was, was was Black Americans. We we thought it was Italians. We thought they all sounded Italian. We we pictured this bunch of guys looked like us standing under the street lamp on a, on a corner, harmonizing, which to some extent happened, mm-hmm. but. Uh, a whole lot of it was African Americans, but who never got to have their picture or get the publishing credit for the music. And that kind of evolved into to Motown, which was my hometown's first, in addition to automobiles, which I was never that big on, but Motown music was the biggest inspiration. That's If there's a single model for Lookout, it was Motown, because it was a bunch of people with no money and who were way down further down the social ladder and socioeconomic ladder than I was, but had some good music and had no way of getting it out to the public. So they said, well, we'll do it ourselves. We'll start our own record company. We'll record in the bathroom if we need to for an echo chamber. We'll, we'll go around and with a bunch of records in the back of the car and in the trunk of the car and sell them to one shop after another. And all of a sudden they put Detroit on the map. I mean, Detroit was a big city then, uh, a rich city, but it was also a polluted industrial hellhole. And suddenly it was famous for something that was a lot cooler. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, In mid sixties, they put on a a free show in the, at the state fairgrounds for the Supremes who had just scored a couple of number one hits and everybody came out to see it. I was so excited to see it was the first time I'd ever felt proud of anything of my of my city or of my my culture and 
to see everybody, black and white people, dancing together and singing together and sharing pride in the city. I don't think anything like that had ever happened in Detroit history before. And yeah. it was music, homegrown DIY music that did it. Yeah, that's the original, like like you're saying, that's that's the original DIY label. Like long before the punk thing kind of took it up and turned it into ultimately something that was marketable in a, in a way to sell something. This was the necessity for Motown. Like they built it. Well, to be completely up. accurate, there was tons of DIY labels during that time and before that time. It's just none of them ever made it an impact to that. Yeah. Extent. Well, that's um, the thing. Well, that, that, like, it's the export, right? Like all around the world. Like Motown is Detroit music. I, I mean, yeah. No, and, uh, and I, I, I've said this story a hundred times, but I think it really bears repeating is that Motown had the, the convict courage of their convictions and or the chutzpah to put on their, on their at the label of every record the sound of young America. Not the sound of Black America, not the sound of soul, not the sound of just the sound of Young America. That that's how big they were dreaming. Mm -hmm. They said this is music for all of Young America and eventually the world, and and it became they became true. I, nobody would have ever believed that that possible because in those days, if you didn't get an agent or a manager out in Hollywood or New York, you probably would be like the guy that would spend his whole time driving around with a bunch of 45s in your in your car trying to get somebody to buy a few. And I knew people, you know, uh, white musicians in my, uh, in my neighborhood too, who, you know, rock musicians who did the same thing, made, made records and sold a, sold a thousand or two and thought that was a big success. But it was Motown that said, look, we can come, go from the ground up and reach the whole world. And, you know, I didn't, come anywhere near their heights, but that was my vision for Lookout. It really was to, not that we were going to be huge, but that that was a possibility that I was prepared. If, if a million or a hundred million people wanted to hear our music, then I was prepared to, to provide it. Mm -hmm. if only a thousand wanted to hear it. Well, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it changed my world. <laughs> you know, like I don't think I'd be sitting here talking to you if it wasn't for Look at Records. It's it's very touching to to realize, and I I do get reminders regularly that how how far it reached. Um, I, you know, from time to time I say, oh, if only I had done this or hadn't done that, you know, maybe we would have gone on to be a have sold a hundred million records and have be far bigger. And, and yet, I have to also contemplate at the same time, but what, what would my life be like? I, mm. would, I, would I like my life as much if that were the case? Because I, I know a few people that have made considerable fortunes in the music business, and I remember visiting one of them. And, uh, and this was during kind of a slack period, which was why he had time to just hang out and, 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 and shoot the shit for, for an afternoon. But even in this slack period, the phone kept ringing and ringing and people, you know, it would be the lawyer, it would be the agent, it would be some, oh, you got to do this, you got to talk to so-and-so. And I'm like, you guys aren't even doing anything for another year. I mean, you're taking the year off. Why? And he says, oh, it's just part of the business. And I'm like, wait, I thought the whole point of becoming a fabulous success in the music industry was that you didn't have to do anything that you didn't want to. Yeah. He said, yeah, you would think that, but... Uh, but no, the, 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 the more successful you get, the busier you get. And I, I, I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe just moderate success is kind of better in, some, in a lot of ways. Uh, my biggest regret about Lookout actually is not that I didn't make it bigger or make more money or anything like that. It's that I let down, by leaving the way that I did, I let down a lot of the musicians. I, I felt like that they were counting on me to, to look after their interests. In fact, the name Lookout, that's one of the meanings of it. I look out for you. Mm. Um, and I honestly thought that the, the label was on a sound enough footing that it would continue to do that, even though I didn't want to be involved with it anymore. Unfortunately, it didn't. And a lot of people kind of their records went out of print and they didn't get paid. and. It was a sad scene, and I felt, 
you know, it was beyond my control to, to really do much about it because I had signed away all the rights to the, to the label. But, you know, I actually have gone around and apologized to pretty much all of them that I could find. But there you go. That's regrets. We've had, we've had a few. Well, like, I think it's, that's the thing is it all, unless it goes on in perpetuity, it has to come to an end at a certain point, but the impact that it has, like, I find there's so many people that come on the show that are of uh, a certain age, like myself, where you were either an epifat kid or you were a lookout kid. <laughs> and it's amazing how many people on the show were lookout kids. And I think the lookout kids weren't, cause there wasn't really a lookout later on. There was like, I think a lookout sound that people would try and say like, Oh, that's a lookout sound. But prior to that, like neurosis doesn't sound anything like crim shrine doesn't sound anything. Yeah, like. Yeah. 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 I bought there. I, I was just having this argument recently. There is a lookout sound. It's just that you can't very easily define it. It's almost more of a lookout look too. I mean, one, one thing about the lookout sound is it, it sounds cheap <laughs> because we didn't have any money. <laughs> yeah. So everything was produced really cheaply. Um, but with integrity and you can kind of, well, again, I would harken back to Motown that their first records were produced uh, probably just as cheaply as ours. And yet the music was so good that it shone through. And, and sometimes I think back in fact, to all of the songs that I listened to as a teenager when rock and roll was still pretty new. And when the first transistor radios came out at the end of the fifties, I mean, there's a tiny, tinny little speaker that, you know, just like, sound like absolute garbage. It was, you know, compared to what we can listen to on our on our phones now, the, this transistor radio was, you'd, you'd throw it in the trash probably if you heard your, and yet that music that we heard coming through that crackly speaker was so powerful that it just changed our whole worldview. Uh, it just made us like feel, you know, in, um, invulnerable and super powerful like this is rock and roll this is like the and and you know the first time i heard uh stevie wonder when he was five years old i was doing my paper route and he was he came on my transistor radio and i was like almost dancing down the street and you know the music is way more powerful powerful than the technology and well and i would and i would also argue that you know like Opera, like some of those early seven inches still sound way more fresh than a lot of them big, huge major label records that were coming out with super compressed drum sounds and very, you know, like there's something about these records that's timeless and raw. Yeah, but it, it, it makes me crazy to try and contemplate it because I hear nowadays almost anybody with a laptop in their living room can make a, a record that sounds like a, a million dollar studio that we yeah. could have never dreamed of using in those days. Now that doesn't some of the music's really good, some of it's not so good. But I think another comparison is like when my family got our first television in 1954, we were the last ones on the block to get one, but um, it was a 10 inch screen, not even as big as my laptop. And all six of us would sit around and watch it. And it, it seemed just as dynamic and real as my 65 inch uh, watt flat screen today. I mean, if, if not, probably more so because I was a young kid and television was new and exciting. And uh, I was like, oh my God, it, you, know, you could just, get, it was all black and white, of course, too. And, and a really lousy picture. We had a bed spring up in the attic that we had to go jiggle every time we <laughs> changed the station to get, to get it right. And, and yet, you know, I can remember those programs so vividly. It's kind of, uh, the art does does shine through. But mm -hmm. speaking of the epifat sound and the lookout sound, it's it's kind of thing that I, I, I almost have to laugh at myself because even today I can still get a little bit head up if somebody lumps them all together, the lookout and the epifat sound. Uh, it's not like we were big rivals or anything. I, I knew those guys and talked to them and never had a fight or an argument or anything. And, and I respect the way they did business and, the, and their success, which they've had a lot of and deserve. But I would say if you think Lookout and Epitaph or Fat are the same thing, you weren't, I don't think you were listening. It's just mm -hmm. like, a, they're, they're both, they're, they're both a, a certainly valid form of music and expression. 
they're so different. How could you not hear the difference? You know? Well, it's funny you brought up that art earlier, like the influence of comedy music on yourself. And and, because I also thought Lookout always had much more of a sense of humor and kind of like a a self-awareness in in the way it was kind of like, you know, like the the fanzine and all this kind of aspects of it. Whereas a lot of those other labels were were record labels where Lookout was. (laughs) Yeah, well, they had they had a Southern California orientation, which was always more business like. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was another aspect uh, to it. Part part of it was due to my my uh, original partner in Lookout, who who left after two years because he thought it was be turning into too big of a business and corporation. This was when we were selling a few thousand records a year. <laughs> yeah, say. Uh, but he he injected a lot of that really uh, snarky humor into it, and also because he was you know, considerably younger than me, he also gave a lot of the useful energy and attitude. Um, and I don't know how much either of us were conscious of this, but I became conscious of it later on, that our whole marketing technique, if you want to call it that, I, I actually got asked to lecture to some business school seminar about marketing. And I said, well, geez, we never had a director of marketing other than ourselves, but we never even used the word but if you would say that with a marketing technique, it was basically to say to the young kids, like the, the ones who didn't have a record label, who didn't have a, a band that spoke to them, to say, hey, kids, this is the smart alecky kind of upstart cool label and the cool kind of punk that's not your big brother's punk, not your mm-hmm. dad's punk. It's just like... You know, we don't take all that stuff so seriously. This is the fun kind of punk. And we're because we're so, you know, busy laughing and having fun. You know, your your grumpy older brother with his really serious hardcore is probably never going to like it or understand it. So this is your music. And um, we got, we, I mean, I, I think, like I said, well, I don't think we were consciously thinking that, but kind of maybe intuitively because immediately... We, we started getting mail orders and letters from all these kids all over America and Canada, 14, 15, 16 years old. You guys are so cool. I want to come to Gilman and see you guys. You know, and, yeah. and I don't think, I mean, I'm sure that they ordered plenty of records from Epitaph and Fat, but I doubt that, that those labels got fan letters. Like yeah. We, yeah, it felt like it was a, you know, like a culture. Like there was also the fact that it was very curatorial, like, it wasn't just bands that were all coming out of Southern California or California. Like the fact is you had bands from Chicago, from, from Richmond, from Massachusetts. Like you had like a real, like, it felt like this was a, when you went to look out, it wasn't always going to sound the same, but you knew that it was always going to be curated in a certain way. I, 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 again, that was a word I did not know or understand or use at the time, but yeah, I, I felt, I don't know. Uh, I, I turned down a lot of bands and records that would have been extremely successful in the, at least in commercial terms. But I felt that pretty much everything that I did approve and accept, I could stand by and say, yep, this it may not be my absolute favorite type of music, but it's good. It's got integrity and there are people who will relate to it and benefit from it. And, so I, I feel like I didn't really put out any clunkers except for my own band's very first record, which was should have waited a year or two until we knew how to play better. <laughs> I dig that record. I, I like that record. I like that's the thing. I, in my high school yearbook, I thanked Look at One to Twelve um, because I think that <laughs> like I think One to Twelve, it's like if I was going to give someone like what's punk, I would be like, okay, well here it is. Just listen to all these records, and that'll give you like kind of a good swath of of punk um you know certainly in a certain geographical area but like the fact that you've got neurosis and sticky at the same time they have crimp crimp shrine and operation ivy like and yeasty girls and like just like it's it's not any one sonic there it's a lot of sonics that are all indicative of what punk is to me well i'm still a little bit embarrassed by that first lookouts record although there were there were fans we used to be pen pals with a group up, uh, I think they're up your way, uh, the Sons of Ishmael, which were from yes. a place called Meaford, Ontario. I think it's not too far from Toronto. It's very close to Toronto, and they are, I would say, 
you know, probably they, they are as close as we get to hardcore legends in this part of the world. Well, they, we, we kind of relate. I mean, they, they and us both did a lot of yelling and banging and screaming. And, <laughs> um, they had a good sense of humor. I don't know if I've ever, I think we may have met them finally at Gilman, but I'm not even sure. I said, I felt like that they would get letters. And... They played the Gilman with youth of today. Um, oh, oh, I think oh. in 87 or 88, maybe 87. Yep, I would uh, I would have been there then. I Yusuf today stayed uh, at our house uh, when I was living at the Maxim Rock and Roll House, and <laughs> I stayed up all night talking about LSD with uh, Ray of today, who was just getting into his uh, Swami thing. Then that's, not, that's <laughs> probably not right. I don't think they called him Swami, but he's hard. He was here, so. he was a Krishna. He became Harry Krishna. Yeah, he was becoming. Uh, I don't know if he had totally become straight edge yet. Well, he, he was talking about straight edge a lot. And so I was quite surprised that he was interested in LSD. And I said, oh, yeah, a lot of people feel like LSD creates a spiritual experience. And he's like, I'm after a spiritual experience. Well, tell me about this. And so we stayed up at the Maxim Rock and Roll House all night talking about spiritual experiences. But that's amazing. the last time I've ever seen him. But I did see you today a few times in those days. And, uh, well, I, I was going to ask you to ask you one of the bands um, because there, I know there's a connection actually between um, I think the guy that recorded the um, surrogate brain seven inch recorded pay or was in pavement. And I was going to ask, like, I know there's a pre pavement punk band and they always had like a weird sense of humor. And I was wondering if you had any in, interactions with them or if they were ever going to be on the label. I honestly don't know who recorded the surrogate brains record. Do you, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to get, I've got it in my notes here. I'm going to, I just got to find the actual note. And I this. don't know if I know anybody was in, that was in pavement and I'm not sure I may have seen pavement once, but I may not have either because there's a lot of things that blur together. So I'm afraid I can't help you in, in that department, but the surrogate brains were um, criminally underrated i think as we yeah were. absolutely great band and that that split seven inch they did uh with uh i am the hamster is also <laughs> pretty fantastic yes we uh i am the hamster we don't want to forget about them there were a lot of bands that uh in the gilman era that um had names that were you know like what <laughs> another one of my favorites was uh nasal sex uh, nasal sex is incredible they're on that comp with the lookouts too but uh i love that lp that they did uh, and oh, they, yes poof, why let's throw some tomatoes at why don't we throw some tomatoes at those guys there wasn't <laughs> um i one of the uh my happiest memories of gilman i i you may have heard about this elsewhere but when Slapshot, that very aggressive hardcore hockey band from boston came to oh gilman, yep yep and it was kind of rude for us to suddenly have this guy with a waving a broken hockey stick, hockey stick and yelling at us. I mean, rah, 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 rah. And, and by that time, we had developed the whole aesthetic of the Gilman Geeks, which was mm -hmm. basically be really silly and fun and laugh a lot. So we immediately made a pit out of, you know, there was like, I, I have to admit, I don't remember the name. There's some of these children's toys that they can ride around, uh, like big wheels, big wheels, big boys, yeah, no, there, was, there was like those we were running around in a circle we were hopping around like leap playing leapfrog and uh and doing uh monkey at the zoo imitations and stuff and the more we did it the angrier this guy <laughs> got and the, there was a knot of maybe 10 15 20 hardcore boys in the middle like we were, we were doing a ring around them and they were standing there punching the air and shouting <laughs> along with the band and but we the, the geeks completely outnumbered them and, and the more we laughed and made fun the angrier the singer got well the shouter got and he finally at the end he said i play anywhere uh anytime for any crowd but i'm not gonna put up with this kind of crap this is like punk rock romper room this is you bunch of <laughs> and <laughs> And we thought that was even better. We thought we really, and then Tim Yohannan, the Maximum Rock and Roll guy who was big in, in Gilman came out and yelled at us because we weren't showing respect. And, yeah. You know, respect is earned. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you though, because he, it seems like, I think that, I think that 
a story comes up in one of the books, um, one of the punk books, where they talk about that, and then how Tim was really offended by that because you I guys was were surprised. Being yeah, because I thought I knew him pretty well, and he was a real smart ass himself. He never hesitated mm-hmm. to make, like, well, all those straight edge bands when they stayed, he, he when when uh, he used to today and instead and no for an answer, they all went out together, and when they came back in, he said, uh, and they were all wearing jack like kind of matching sports jack well what are you guys on a baseball team <laughs> and then they argued and argued for all afternoon and he just kept ridiculing them so that's how i expected tim to anybody that took themselves too seriously that's how he was he would make he would make fun of me all the time too whenever i would get on a high horse about the environment or whatever my causes were but no, when it came to Slapshot, he was just dead serious. <laughs> you got to show respect for it. Even if you don't appreciate the style of music, you got to show respect. Yeah. Um, it was kind of, uh, I don't know if I, I hadn't thought of this before, but that may have been the beginning of the end of uh, when Tim and I began to fall out because gradually over time we got on each other's nerves more and more until such time as I was excommunicated more or less from the maximum rock and roll fold. Were the guys that were singing along and yelling in the middle, rabid lassie? Um, <laughs> some of them may have been, but I don't necessarily okay. think so. There was, this was at the period when there was a transformation taking place. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know rabid lassie became a straight edge band. Unipride or, or breakaway. Right? Breakaway. Yes. And, um, there was another one called Bold and Walter Glazer, who was the cover star of the Turn It Around 7 Inch. Yeah. He was going around saying, Ray of Today is making all the bands change their name to laundry detergents. And, and he, to- he told he told Rabbit Lassie to change their name to, to Breakaway. And, um, I honestly, I remember, I don't think Rabbit Lassie had made the transformation yet at that point. But there was this one kid, probably about 16, a, a tall, skinny kid that used to always come and chat. Like we would usually have a table where we would sell records at the back of Gilman. And this kid would, very earnest, uh, thoughtful, smart kid. And he would come and chat about music and philosophy and stuff. And then, like a lot of teenagers, he, teenage, mostly teenage boys, he got into the whole macho hardcore thing. And so I remember him standing in the center of that group of uh teenagers punching the air and you know looking very man or trying to look very manly and all of a sudden and it made me a little sad because uh not that that music was all bad by any means but it didn't really leave room for a lot of nuance um mm. like a lot of the bands that played gilman were pretty hardcore you know neurosis being a good example but there was artistry and poetry and, and beauty to it too i used to liken them to a Wagner symphony, like the about the about the collapse of the of the of the civiliz- of civilization or the end of the world. Um, I'm very very proud of the album that we put out on Lookout with 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 Neurosis. It's just it still holds up to this day in my view. Oh, exactly. I, I love the, the the that's one of my favorite Neurosis records. I think the single's incredible too, but I just think the LP is just godly. Yeah, I I and I honestly I didn't even know what I was doing and I didn't know that much about them, but something, I remember I went around, well, cause David, my original partner had brought them to look out to do that 12, uh, that seven inch. And then he left shortly afterwards. And, um, I, my, my philosophy was that if you, as long as you didn't do anything like illegitimate or dishonest or something, and, you know, if you were on look had made, had a record on lookout, you were, you could come back and make another one. So in principle, I thought, well, I guess neurosis gets to have another record if they want, but they're kind of David's band. And so I went to, to see them and asked if they wanted to stay on lookout or they wanted to go with his new label. And at the time I didn't know that much about them, but we got to chatting about influences and discovered that we were both big King Crimson fans. And, and at that point I said, well, if you want to make an album on Lookout, you're welcome to do it. And they said, yeah, but we're going to have to have a double this recording budget of any record 
before on Lookout, and we're going to have to have a full color cover, which in those pre-computer days meant, uh, you know, <laughs> big money, big big it, money. Yeah, the the art doing the four color art for the cover uh, costs at least as much as the recording budget. <laughs> Yeah. So it was by far the most expensive uh, record look out it had ever made, and it was a bit of a gamble, uh, a lot of a gamble. Except that, of course, it did very well, and uh, you know, I mean, it's one that I'm still proud of today. Oh yeah, and like I think you look at them. Yeah, obviously, um, Operation Ivy is a different band, but you like look at that as being a precursor directly to Rancid, Green Day as well. Like those bands survive. Like those are those are bands that have gone decades decades with their with their band and taking it to new places and, and well neurosis are at least semi-active still too oh absolutely they they put out a record two years ago that's fantastic steve uh just put out a new record this year and like oh they are i've uh, to me they're the grateful dead of hardcore like i will follow them around and listen to live recordings <laughs> like of the dead see my my uh the one the punk band that i followed around was uh was the weaker thans Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, and a lot of people like that band as well. Like they're that. But, but the, I think, three, the three bands I have seen most are the Weaker Than's, Green Day, and the Grateful Dead. Really? <laughs> That's awesome. I never followed the Grateful Dead around, but in some uh, a few times they followed me around. But uh, <laughs> uh, but when I first lived in California, they were still at the stage where they were often playing for free in the park. So yeah, basically they were they were just there. It was kind of like. We did a rehash of that in the later on when in, in Michigan when the MC5 and the Stooges would always play for free in the park. And, well, and, I was going to ask you, were you into that Detroit rock and roll stuff when that was all popping? Oh off? yeah, I saw I saw the uh, MC5 the uh, first time the same summer that I first saw the Supremes. In the, That's in, amazing! In what a summer! They were not they were not a hippie band yet. They were trying to be a mod band. Mm -hmm. And there's a funny story about that. They called, I, I talked to them afterward. They were in a battle of the bands. Just, they, they grew up just about a mile away from me. And we're all about the same age. And they, um, they were in a battle of the bands with the band that lived on, on, in my neighborhood next block over. So we had to cheer for them. But I thought the MC5 were better, but they lost in a battle of the bands. Home field, home, it was on a tennis court. So it was home, home field advantage. Um, but I, I did think they were better, and I went and talked to them afterwards, and because they had these really cool clothes from England, and um, they were trying to be mods. And I said, "What's what's the, what's the deal with your music?" And the singer said, "Well, we we play Avon rock," and, <laughs> and I was like, "What the heck is that?" I mean, I didn't want to show my ignorance, but I said, "Well, they they're English influence, so it must have something to do with Shakespeare and Stratford on Avon and stuff." Yeah, <laughs> and it wasn't until years and years and years later I read in a book that it was Avon rock that was spelled like avant garde, <laughs> but they just did not how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> and well, there you know that was kind of we were a, a blue collar community down yeah London, of course down, yeah. down river Detroit, which is mostly most of our parents were factory workers and mill workers and and that uh, wasn't a common word like it wasn't said on the radio it wasn't like you people weren't talking about avant garde art in mainstream well, society it, if you if you were to pick up the Village Voice or something you would hear about the avant garde film and stuff but mm -hmm. there was not a lot of avant our Village Voice readers in in my <laughs> neighborhood that the least thought that I knew of. So I don't know which one of them picked up on it. I never spent a lot of time. I saw them play a lot of times, but I never spent much time hanging out with them uh, until uh, years later after the MC5 had broken up. Uh, I started hanging around a lot with a band called Destroy All Monsters. Oh my God, dude. Which, yeah. One of the best bands ever. Well, Michael from the MC5 was in that band and Ron Ashton from the yep. Stooges was in that band. And I was pretty good buddies with a, the singer who was called Niagara, who's now a very distinguished artist, a brilliant artist. But at that time she was, people did not like a lot of women singers in the old days. She did not get the kind of respect that she was, that she was, should have been entitled to. And people mostly came and like, sort of just to ogle her and to marvel at Ron's guitar solos and stuff, which which made me kind of sad. But anyway, Michael from the MC5, he we, we used to chat quite a bit about philosophical things. 
So it was kind of disappointing in the, have you seen the MC5 movie, A True Testimonial? Absolutely. When, because it did the Toronto Film Festival when it was one of the few actual screenings for it. Yeah, because it, it made me kind of sad because in the movie, he was obviously a, kind of burnt out at that point. That was like yeah. not long before he died. Because when I, when I knew him in the early 80s, uh, he was extremely articulate, uh, you know, great companion, great guy to hang out with. Um, but yeah, the Stooges and AMC Five. They, it's funny. I, I always try to make this point because people, kids especially, will always say, "Oh, I wish I lived at Berkeley so I could go to Gilman," or "I wish, well, I wish I was around back in the '60s or the '70s or the '80s or whenever." And I'm like, you know, you really got to cherish what you have now because we were the same way in 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 Detroit and Ann Arbor in the '60s. People would say anything, anybody playing this week, and oh, just the Stooges in the five again. You know, <laughs> I guess I'll go if it's free. What about uh, the Dogs? You know that band? They they became a punk band later on, but they were that Detroit. would have been after my Detroit time, I believe. Okay, they, uh, yeah, because I think they started as a Detroit garage rock band, but there's just so much stuff around that time, like Up. There's so many other little bands up. that aren't. Did you say the Up? Yeah, the Up. Yeah, they were the uh, the third string uh, White Panther trans love band. Yeah, they they were the ones that played when you couldn't get the MC5 or the Stooges, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't break up as soon. Now, you know, I don't mean to be dismissive because uh, a couple of the members went on to they're still playing music. Uh, the music's they, fantastic. They, they, I like their band a lot too. But at the time, the Up were kind of picked on and made the butt of a lot of jokes because they only had one really distinguishable song, which was just like an Aborigine. Oh yeah, yeah. But when I used to volunteer at the White Panther House, they practiced in the next room, and they were one thing they were distinguished for was being the loudest band around. They were kind of a precursor. Well, no, they were kind of in the same vein as Blue Cheer. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they they were a lot like Blue Cheer. They just like, well, we don't know how to play much, but we can, we know how to play it really, really loud. And so I my job volunteering at the White Panther House was to answer. The phone typically I'd be in the front office and uh, some phone would ring uh, hello trans love and um, suddenly <laughs> and, and I'd say you have to wait to hang on a minute wait till the song's over don't worry it won't last long because <laughs> their songs are mostly 30 second <laughs> and I had uh, John Lennon call there one time when uh, in the middle of this uh, you probably heard about how John Lennon and Yoko Ono did a benefit for John Sinclair when he was in prison. And I mm -hmm. was kind of the phone answer or spokesperson at the house that, while well, that was getting on. And, uh, and he, and he, he called up, I, I could tell it was him, but I, I wanted to say, Hey John, tell me about the new blah, blah, blah. I, <laughs> I, just, I just passed him on to uh, the person he wanted to speak to. But after the up finished the, practicing their song, my, my friend Hiawatha, who lived at the house and also did the phone answering, he, he apparently answered the phone. Also, uh, got when John Lennon called, and, and he he reacted by saying, "Oh yeah, oh, and the, and the, uh, you're, oh yeah, you're John Lennon, right? Oh yeah, well I'll put you through, but he's he's got a conference call or with David Bowie right now." So uh, <laughs> um, Hiawatha did not believe him. Um, yeah, I kind of knew it was him. Uh, and, that was that was an exciting adventure, but shortly after that, John Sinclair got out of prison, and I kind of said, you know what, this is kind of turning into a, a cult. And I left one day. I, I had been working every day solid for months without any time off, and I said, I'm going to take a day off, and I never came back. So you and, were very political, too, because this was it, obviously a political It was completely organization. political. It was, like, obsessively political, and some of the guys – we're talking about, you know, weapons training and going on yeah. the ground. And um, the, the, the similarities are kind of eerie between that and maximum rock and roll, except mm -hmm. minus the drugs. You know, maximum rock and roll had no drug involvement. Uh, trans, trans love white Panther party was, you know, you know, nothing, but, well, I shouldn't say nothing, but, but drugs were permeated every aspect of the existence. Like, if there's going to be a staff meeting, if there's going to be a conference, if there's going to be a meal, if there's going to be anything, we'll get out the, the joints first. And um, 
And um, I, you know what really did it for me was one day when, uh, after John Sinclair had been out for a few days, or a few weeks rather, he came back from making a speech at the local high school about telling the kids not to do hard drugs. And, and I said, John, you went and made a speech about telling people not to do cocaine. And yet you come home and you do cocaine with the other members of the central committee. We were divided into central committee, uh, the authorities and the cadre, which is, it's like, it's like Chinese communist party jargon. Mm -hmm. And, and he said, Oh, well, yes, my public position is completely correct. It's just a matter of bringing my private practices <laughs> to the line with my public position. <laughs> <laughs> and, I was like, that was kind of when I said, you know what, this is a little, I don't see this end ending well. And so I'm, I'm gone. And then 20 some 30 years later, I'm in Maximum Rock and Roll House and having a similar discussion with Demi Hanna. And, and I'm like, it's the same thing. I mean, now Tim, Tim used to be quite a pot smoker. He, I don't know if you knew this before he uh, came to California when he was still on the East Coast. Okay. We, I, did an, I did an interview with him uh, for a Lookout magazine where I, I was, it was basically a theme issue about what happened to the hippies, you know, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And in the interview, I discovered that, well, there's a fundamental difference between us. He was a pothead and I was an acid head. <laughs> and it's, it might seem trivial, but it's a very big difference. Yeah. Potheads are more linear. Mm-hmm. They listen to jazz and blues, and they they tend to be more male, and they they kind of have you know everything goes like the music that they listen to, na, 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 na. <laughs> whereas acid heads are like all over the universe and like oh flowers and beautiful opening lotus <laughs> blossoms and cosmic enlightenment and cartoons and uh, oh look here's Mickey Mouse flying floating in. Uh, on a scarlet cloud with a with a silver banner telling me the secret of life. Um, these are, this was my typical uh, experience of the '60s. Mm -hmm. So Tim and I, you know, and we were on opposite coast. I was already in California. He was out on, on the East Coast, and and I said, "Yep, that explains a lot, Tim. That's why you are so bloody rational, and you can never deviate from your course." Mm. Um, but in a sense, I, I don't think he ever met John Sinclair, but I would reckon they had a lot to talk about because they both had this idea that they were going to start a revolution based on rock and roll music. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it also very much, uh, I guess it's a lot of, it happens a lot and whether or not it's a benevolent cult or a malevolent cult, I guess, depends, but there's, there's these cults of personality that develop in, in punk rock and in music. There, there was a cultish aspect, and I don't think either person intended it in any, in any kind of malevolent way. I mean, John Sinclair is still around. I was just watching an interview he did recently on, uh, I mean, basically, he's like 80 years old now, and basically all he talks about is smoking pot. I mean, it's like, you've been smoking pot 60 years, dude. You think by now you've run out of things to say about it, but... No, the interviewer starts out with, so how, how are you doing today, John? Having a good day? And he said, it's a great day. I just got up and had a joint and I'm really <laughs> frightened the whole day. And then I'm going to probably have another one later on. <laughs> well, I, I imagine for people like yourself and him, it, this must feel a little bit validating to be at this point in history. Like obviously conundrums aside about how legalization will go, but you were all proven right. Like, you know, you guys traded your freedom in some cases to make this argument, but like ultimately the world has kind of come on side with this cannabis thing. Well, I'm, I'm actually gone to the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I obviously, as I mentioned before, I do yeah. not want to make it illegal again. That obviously did not work, but at the same time, I don't encourage people to use it. I don't, I, I don't really know the answer to like people often want to ask, well, how did it affect you for a, for a, a good 20 or 30 years? I would have sat here and sworn that it changed my life for the better. In fact, that it transformed my life and made everything possible that happened later on that I no longer believe that I just, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know if the changes that happened to me while I was smoking marijuana 
were because of the drug or in spite of it. I don't know if, in fact, they were just because I was growing up and learning new things. Mm. I, ha I used to have a lot of arguments back in the 80s with my uncle, who was a, a kind of a self-made man, never took a drug in his life, but he was very smart. And uh, one of those guys, very socially liberal, very generous, like when they wanted to cut his taxes, he wrote his congressman and said, don't give me a damn tax cut. I don't need a tax cut. Use the money for something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, uh, he was cons socially kind of conservative. I mean, economically, uh, polit politically liberal, socially conservative. He did not believe in, in drugs or even alcohol to excess. So he would argue with me and I'd say, well, Uncle Chuck, I, you know, I've smoked marijuana for quite a few years and look at all I've accomplished. And he says, and he managed to control himself from saying, well, you haven't actually done that much yet because I had, this was before lookout. Uh, and he says, yes, but Larry, what might you have accomplished if you hadn't been stoned? <laughs> and I, that is something I do not know the answer to. Um, when I finally decided to stop using marijuana, it was after a long period of sitting up there in my house on the mountain. And I, I mentioned this in my book, I think, where I morning after morning, I would get up and say, what a beautiful day. I've got all these awesome things I'm going to do today. I'll just have a coffee and a, a joint and get started. And by the time I was halfway through the joint, I would be so stoned. Remember, this is where the powerful stuff comes from. Uh, I, I would be like, oh, geez, I can't do anything today. And I would, then I would get really depressed because like another day went down the drain and what? So I don't know. Different people react differently. I do know Absolutely. this one woman that used to be part of our hippie scene back a long, long ago. She went on to run a multi, multi, multi million dollar company with hundreds of accountants working for her. And every morning before she goes to work, she smokes pot. Yeah. doesn't take any other drug. She smokes pot, and then she goes up and juggles kajillions of dollars. I couldn't do that, uh, and she can. Um, but then, I don't know. Uh, I, I do not encourage people to use drugs or alcohol. I don't tell them not to. Uh, I had to find my own way. I, made, I had a lot of blind alleys and walked into a lot of walls. Speaking of walking into walls... When I used to drink a lot, I got into, I went to a dance club one night and I'd been drinking quite a bit. And I was saying, oh, I'm going to go out and dance now. And I was having a great time dancing, I thought, but everybody kept pushing me and getting angry with me. And I was like, what's the matter with all these people? Nobody knows how to dance anymore. <laughs> and, I, and I finally said, I hell are these people? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. And I went walking. Um towards the, what I thought was the exit, but I ran into, uh, there was some guy standing in the way and he wanted to get out of my way. And no matter, I'd say, okay, excuse me. I'm going to start to go around him and he would move and get in my way again. I'm, Damn it. I, I said, excuse me, I'm trying to get past. I want to get, and he just would not move. And I, he kind of grinning stupidly at me. Finally, he said, all right, I'm just going to push my way right past him. And I walk right into a mirror. <laughs> I had been on the verge of getting in a fist fight with myself in the mirror. And that kind of sums up a lot of my drug and alcohol experience. Oh, uh, Larry, this has been incredible. And I've kept you for a very long time. And at some point down the line, would you come back and do a part two? Well, if you haven't, if I haven't worn you out or bored you to, uh, to tears by now. Well, if I, I unfortunately, I was going to also burden you with, by saying, can I ask you a couple more questions before I let you go? Because I, this has been incredible well, and I've got, that's what I'm here for. Okay. <laughs> I just actually, one thing I, I forgot to ask you off the very beginning is how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever heard that term? Oh, um, 19, I thought it was 1956, but it may have been 1957. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought everybody knew this story. Um, but it's, well, as you probably know, punk was not always a complimentary word, even, even, even less so back in the fifties. If you call somebody a punk, it mean, it's kind of like a wimp. Mm -hmm. um, it meant that they didn't count for much. And the other half of the story is that this was around the time 
I think that the uh, TV show on Dis Disneyland had a s series on the last of the Mohicans. And so every kid that was worth his salt wanted to get a, a, Mo a Mohican or a Mohawk haircut. Mm -hmm. So this was 19, uh, I think 57. I think I looked it up once and said, oh, it was a year later. And I thought, but at any rate, I was walking down the sidewalk near the school and some kid very much like that asshole in the mirror that wouldn't get out of my way. This kid would not get off the sidewalk and, and he kept not letting me get past. And I was feeling pretty, I don't know, I was a wimp. I was a wimp. And <laughs> so I was very skinny and very little for my age, but I always had this tendency to shoot my mouth off and get in trouble and get people to mad enough to hit me. And he shoved me off the sidewalk and said, get out of the way, punk. And, and I was really humiliated because my little brother, I was, who I was trying to impress, saw me get shoved and called a punk. Uh, but that, in fact, was the first time I got called a punk. <laughs> Do you remember when you first started seeing people that were kind of, you know, like when it was started being thrown around in terms of music? Because it was mentioned in Cream, right, as far back as the 60s. No, um, I'm not sure if the first time I saw it in Cream was probably already 1970 or 71. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. I wrote an article that I submitted to Cream, which they wisely rejected because it was terrible. But, but um where I used the word punk a bunch of times to describe the Stooges uh, reunion concert. In 1973, they had broken up sort of and then came back and did the the, um, the tour for Raw Power. And, yeah. uh, and I, uh, I was trying to make this thing that it was kind of like a fusion of hippie and punk. Like, and I called it Raw Flower Power. That's... <laughs> which is, yeah, it was dumb. Like, no, um, no, that's Dave, awesome. What do you mean that's dumb? That's amazing. That's wicked. Well, maybe it was ahead of its time then, but uh, yeah. Dave Marsh, the editor of Cream, um, had the article and and he um, and Iggy was in his office and he gave it to him and said, what do you think of this? And Iggy apparently uh, tore it into pieces <laughs> and threw it on the floor. <laughs> I still got a copy, but... Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I, I, I would love to read it. The hell with what Iggy thinks about it. Well, I, I think my, my archives have just been uh, all shipped off to Cornell University. So most of my old writing and stuff is up there now. And I don't, I think they're still closed because the epidemic. So a lot of my most embarrassing writing might not be available to the public for, for a while yet. Well, that's a short bus ride for me, and uh, I, I love upstate New York, so I don't know. Maybe I'm going to have to go read some Stooges articles when this pandemic finally clears out. Um, the other thing I was wondering is, like, what was it like when when punk fart started first kind of, like, happening in San Francisco and you started seeing bands like um, the Fuck Ups or, or the Mutants or that kind of, like, first wave of, of stuff that's really happening, negative trend and all that? I was very excited because the whole 70s for me was like waiting for something to happen. Uh, I mean, I, I liked some prog rock and I liked some disco. And I definitely at the beginning of the 70s, I was way into glam rock or glitter rock, as they called it then. Um, but it, it always felt like there was just this slow period and something new and exciting was going to come. And when the first punk shows, the uh, first official punk shows, because like, as, you know, we were using the word to describe Detroit rock way back in the beginning of the 70s. But it was 70s. My, well, my brother was over in England in 76, and he came back and told me about these crazy, you know, these new bands, uh, the Sex Pistols and the Clash and, uh, and the name, you know, the style of punk rock. And then uh, it was only a few months later we started hearing about it in, in California. So the first two uh, official modern punk rock shows I went to were the Ramones at uh, Winterland in San Francisco and the Nuns and the Avengers and I think the Ready Maids at the Mabaway Gardens. Uh, I was especially impressed at the uh, Mabaway show because it was like this, suddenly somebody had sl flipped the switch, you know, and turned out the light on the counterculture and turned it back on. And it was a whole new set of people, mm. you know, le leather jackets instead of buckskins and, uh, you know, tight black jeans instead of bell bottoms. And 
and short hair instead of long hair. And I was like, this is awesome. I've been transported to a whole new culture. And the music is great. I'm, I love this. I'm going to come here every night. Um, and then I started looking around, and I'm like, wait a minute. I know that guy. Oh, wait, I saw her before. They were half, not all, but a lot of them were hippies who had just cut their hair or changed their clothes. <laughs> and in fact, one of the, I don't know if you ever heard of a San Francisco band called The Offs. Absolutely. I love that. What's the number that uh, 6439, I forget, always forget the number they have, but that single's incredible. Yeah, well, Don, Don Vinyl had been, the singer had been a friend of mine years before there was punk. Oh, really? <laughs> And one of the first times I met him was in mid seventies in during that fallow period. And, and he was like hanging out at, at the old Cockettes house that we used to live in. And now it was a different group of, of, of Queens were living there. And, and I, we were all hanging out and he says, Hey, look, I got the new Jefferson Starship album. Want to go take some LSD and listen to it. <laughs> and I said, you know, and it wasn't a very good album. It was when the Jefferson Starship had, you know, kind of really gone. I don't know if you ever heard the first Jefferson Starship, which was a project experimental thing, Blows Against the Empire. I get. I must have heard it because I've heard one record by them that's actually yeah, it's a, it's a concept different. album where they where all the people of Earth get on a starship and then the hippie radicals hijack it. Okay, yeah. And it was a project that had members that are the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and Quicksilver, all these different people. Nothing like what happened later with under that same name. I saw the when they premiered it, it was pretty inspiring. Anyway, the, the album wasn't any good. The acid wasn't that good. <laughs> but for the next several years, actually until he died, I was able to torment Don every time I, I saw him about, <laughs> hey, remember that time we took acid and listened to the Jefferson Starship? And <laughs> if I did it in front of his punk friends, he would be like, what are you talking about? I never, I never liked that kind of stuff. I never, you know. <laughs> um, uh, when you, going back to when you were in Detroit, were you was uh, was there process church stuff happening then? Because I know they had like the Parliament connection later on. Was there pro the process church? You know the uh, that weird cult from England that was like uh, mm -hmm. they've got all oh. reference to it on the Parliament record. Um, because I was also wondering what were the hangovers of kind of like. Because a lot of people that come on the show, especially from Southern California, talk about how there was like a, such a shift culturally post Manson and the Manson murders. And I was wondering what kind of effect that had on oh, culture oh. in San Francisco. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be laughing at something so horrible, but no, no, I, I, I get it. But it's like such a heavy thing that if you live through it, I imagine it. Well, would there be. is a connection, actually. I in 1970, the year after Manson, mm -hmm. I was uh, living in a house in West Berkeley down in the flats, the kind of backward, out, out of the way part of Berkeley. And there was a bunch of real weirdos. I mean, hippies, acid heads, a lot of them were college dropouts from a really fancy school back East. Um, but there was this one, one of the rooms, it was a huge old farmhouse, even though it was in the middle of town. And one of the people upstairs, it was a really weird. I mean, he, he hated women. Uh, I mean, okay. literally hated. Uh, well, he was like radical, radical gay, uh, gay liberation, but it was like women had to be almost exterminated. I once, because I once saw him and I said, I'm on my way over to see so, you know, a couple of girls that we knew. And he says, why are you going to see them? You shouldn't see women. You should, I, they're, they're the worst. They're the embodiment of evil. And I, and I was like, no, that does not make sense. And I, and I walked, finally just gave up trying to reason with him and walked away. He was screaming at me all the way down the street. But he had a tape, a cassette tape, um, which he played for me one day. And he said, yeah, this was, this was when Charlie and the gang used to live in, in the hate. And they would have black masses. And so... Whoa. And he and it was a, just a bunch of people going rah, 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 like a bunch of voices, like some kind of chanting. It, it sounded just like creepy and stupid to mm -hmm. me. But you know, he had he kept this cassette and and, and played it, um, and apparently stood in some kind of reverence of it. Uh, but yeah, that was the that was the beginning of. I think people really realized that up to a point, everybody thought, well. 
we may have our differences, but all of us are hippies and countercultural people and revolutionaries together, and we're all united to make a new world. And at that point, it began to become obvious that not only were some people not very nice or really only interested in money or really only interested on hitting in hit or hitting on vulnerable young girls or whatever, but some of them were just downright evil yeah. and insane. And, and it wasn't always easy to tell which were, were which. Now, mm -hmm. when somebody plays you a Charles Manson tape, you can probably pretty safely figure, yeah, I probably don't want to get too close to this guy. <laughs> Especially if it's like a, a, not even an official release. Like he's got like a home dub copy of a Charles Manson thing. But there, you know, everything began to fall apart in that, in that sense. So even though a lot of the stuff that people associate with the sixties actually happened in the seventies, mm -hmm. a lot of the so-called free love and the, and the hair and the costumes and stuff. Um, I don't know. Abby Hoffman once said that about, uh, about Woodstock. He's, you know, somebody said it was like a giant celebration or birthday party for, for our culture. And he, and he, Abby Hoffman said, no, nah, it's more like a funeral. Yeah. And in a, in a sense it was, I didn't, I didn't realize it at the time either. Um, but it was, it was kind of like, you know, nothing like that would ever happen again. And couldn't, I mean, they had bigger festivals, but not, not DIY, not homegrown, not spontaneous like Woodstock was. Well, it's by the time the mainstream picks up on something, it's almost like the actual excitement of it is is gone. Um, I, I think I quote this in my book, but uh, it's a it's a Chinese proverb that I heard long, long ago. Um, as soon as you give a name to something, it begins to die. Mm. And that doesn't that can refer to a musical movement. It can refer to a relationship. It can refer to basically anything. As long as it's just happening, growing organically, and you know it, it's open ended, it could go really far. It could get really big, but the minute that you say that is a relationship, I'm we're husband and wife, we're a, a punk rock scene, we're a, a band, we're a type of something, anything, it does literally begin to die because you've brought it into being. Therefore, you have planted the seed of its end. Yeah. And, that's, I think, it, it was it was a dilemma I wrestled with. Re I mean, people might laugh at this, but I seriously spent weeks and months walking around my land up in the mountains, arguing with myself whether to shut lookout down when my partner David left, because I knew it would never be the same again. But I also knew that the bands were good enough and it was working well enough that if it kept on going, it would become a lot bigger and it would end up having the same kind of effect, effect as you described that eventually we would lose a lot of what was special and magic about it. So I said, I can either kill it now or I can let it grow and risk that it will turn into something massive that I hate. Um, and it, and it's a, I felt like that's a big responsibility to decide. And, since my partner had left, I had nobody but myself to decide it. But walking around the land, the way that I decided it was because I had spent several years during the, the broke years when I had nothing much to do except wander around the land, mm -hmm. looking at trees and talking to trees and watching how the, the hillsides like kind of, they, they move actually, land, land moves like a few inches a year and things change and if you have to look very closely and i said well these trees these every year they put out these beautiful leaves they grow rich and full and then they fall into the earth and rot and it, it all starts all over again and i said well i can't think that these leaves or these trees everything oh what's the use it's all just going to fall apart at the end of the year anyway so why bother flowering and putting out leaves no, they just keep doing it. And ideally it gets a little bit better and a little bit more beautiful each time. But at that point I said, yeah, I know. Okay. It might all turn to shit probably sooner or later will, 
but it's part of the wheel of life that you know this is my place on it and to to uh but so i will play my part and see where it goes and i think you know and obviously you know the bands are doing their music no matter what but the fact that that the way it happened with lookout records without lookout records it wouldn't have happened in the same way and i think that's the important thing like looking back on it from a completely separate place like myself that's the thing that went around the world like this this music i've been all over the place and and these bands you know as you know resonate around the world and there's just for something so modest to have that kind of global effect is just so inspiring well, if I want to crawl up my own ass from time to time, uh, that's one thing that I that I, I can kind of think about is if Lookout hadn't happened, or if I if I had shut it down, then what would have happened to certain bands? Would some of the bands have have never got a chance to put a record out and therefore never be heard from and given up and broken up? Maybe one of one of my inspirations for starting the label was a a, a band of some friends of mine. In fact, the, the same guy that I talked about earlier that had been in the Ravers joined a, a new wave power pop band in San Francisco in 79. And they were, were they called? They were called the pushups. They, some, uh, they do a record, right? Like global a record has just come out. Finally, I've been, I've been carrying around their, uh, their last songs on a cassette tape for all these years. And I put it up on my website hoping that someday somebody would hear it. And finally somebody put out a record of, of uh, some of their best songs. But I was kind of their half groupie, half wannabe manager. I, basically I just followed them around everywhere because um, I thought they were so great and tried to give them the benefit of my insight. But at that time, of course, I was just some, some new wave guy. Uh, and I said, look, just, keep doing this. You guys are going to be famous. You can be like the next, the, the power pop new wave Beatles. Mm. Um, but they fell apart because they could not agree on how to get an agent, how to get a demo, how to, you know, they were trying to go the industry route and it never worked out. And they, they, they gave up finally started fighting among each other and broke up. And I, for years and years afterward, I thought if only, somebody had been able to put out those records and get them started. And when I, when the, the new bands, the punk bands began to emerge around Gilman, that was kind of what I was thinking. Like, I don't want to see that happen again. That mm -hmm. beautiful band like that will be lost to history because nobody gave them a chance. Well, and I know there's other labels, but it's, it's hard to think of another label that was doing it the way Lookout, like you did it, right? Like, or uh, you guys did it in the there beginning. Was, there were no other labels in the East Bay. At the like time. that, nothing like that. Yeah. Well, I, no, and, I mean, they're, they're, for, the, for the Lookout, for the, rather, I, I mean the Gilman bands, which a lot became the Lookout band. No, there was no, uh, there was nobody. Um, and in fact, you know, when I, when I, after I saw Operation Ivy the first time and I, and Tim, who was called Lint at the time, came and said, so, Larry, what'd you think? And I said, do, do you guys want to make a record? And he was like, it was just so far-fetched. I mean, they'd yeah. only been playing a few months. And and that was the case with all those bands, with with Isocracy, with, uh, with Crimshine. None of them expected to make a record. It was just like, like well, years, year, many years later, interviewing Rancid, I asked them about that. And Tim said, well, we really wanted to have a record, but we were thought, we thought you were insane. We said, we, we don't want our friend to lose all his money, but we really want to have a record. We were really kind of torn up about it. But, well, we decided, well, we'll give it a chance. But, God, we, 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 we thought you had no idea what you were doing. When I went to look at records, the, when you guys had this, the store, I, I think um, – uh, I went there and I was talking to them because I was a punisher. So I would just hang out in that store when I'd go to Berkeley and just punish the shit out of the poor people working. And they told me that the Operation Ivy record was the biggest selling record ever, like more than any of the Green Day records. Is that true? Um, it's it's seesawed back and forth over okay. the years. And I don't know where it is now. Now, yeah. Um, I know that I'm, well, I actually, I don't know for sure. And, and, nobody has really firm data because for the first few years there was no sound scan or any of that kind of stuff yeah um 
But I would guess that all both Green Day records and the Operation Ivy are a million sellers, but I wouldn't say how much more than a million they went. And, it, it's, but it's for, for, the, for the first five, um, from 1989 until 1994, um, Operation Ivy was by far our best seller, but Green Day weren't like, you know, not, not they were in the running, but still considerably behind. And then when Dookie came out, Green Day suddenly started selling like 5,000, 10,000 every week. Yeah. But Operation Ivy did too. Yeah, so Green I mean, Day did pass them up by quite a lot for a, for a while there, but another couple of years later, then Green Day slowed down in operation. Ivy kept going, and I think passed them up again. Because I think when I was working at a record store, we used to get the Mortem fax that would come in. It would always have the top seller, and it would always be Energy, like number one at the top. Um, that record did all right, and it almost didn't exist. Um, yeah. <laughs> The first, the first version of it was thrown away because it just couldn't, they just couldn't get it to sound right. And then they kind of just give it, all right, we'll give, we'll give it one more try and went into the studio for, for a few days and there you go. And then they What's, broke up the week it came out. Well, obviously Green Day is Green Day, right? Like, you know, but at the same time from doing this podcast, like from Talib Kweli to, to you name it, every, everyone's been influenced by Operation Ivy. Like that's a band that obviously you know, might not have, you know, become the band that Green Day became in the pop cultural sense. But at the same time, like the impact they had is just like music would not be the same without that band. Well, well, Damien, to be fair, Operation Ivy lasted exactly two years. Uh, and Green Day were around for what was it? Six years before they had a, a, a really big hit record. Mm -hmm. And so who knows what Operation Ivy would have done if they had uh had stuck around a while longer yeah well i'm not going to force you to stick around any longer larry this has been unbelievable you are one of the most fascinating human beings on this <laughs> planet and honestly I, I anytime wish, I, I wish my my mother were god rest her soul were still here to, to hear that because i uh, i think she would have uh really audibly and visibly rolled her eyes at that idea not that she didn't love and cherish me, but she says, she would say, I'm pretty sure I've met more interesting people. He's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if your punk journey had stopped when you moved out to Humboldt County and that had been the end of it, you would have been a perfect guest for the show. Not even including all the other stuff you did post forming the lookouts and lookout records and everything. So anytime, my friend, you are welcome here. Well, if you have me back again, uh, Believe it or not, I have not quite run out of stories yet. Thank you, Larry, for coming on the show when you heard right there. Larry will be back for part two at some point in the near future. But before that happens, we have a another fantastic guest coming up completely different uh, place than Larry. Uh, this is a wrestler who just recently uh, left the WWE and is now a hotly sought after free agent. And don't worry, we get to that burning question. That's on everybody's mind. How the hell does Tommy and know the band Jesus and the gospel fuckers. And we get to the core of this thing and trust me, the answer will shock you. Yes, the guest coming up later on this week on the show is Tommy End from Professional Wrestling. Very, very well-known professional wrestler. Uh, very interesting story as well. And, and yeah, down with Jesus and the Gospel Fuckers, which around here is, is tantamount to being down with the king. So uh, that is it for the show. Uh, remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives of Indigenous people matter. We need to protect trans kids, and we need to help trans people protect themselves. We need to stop hate and violence towards Asian people and just hate and violence towards people of different faiths and people that believe differently. And, and my gosh, it's, it's kind of overwhelming at times. Uh, so, you know, take it in stages. Read, get involved, see what you can do. You know, there's organizations that are doing good work. There's um, lots of places where you can, you know, donate your time, donate your your, your body to help out. 
Um, you know, and I guess the, the, the long and the short of it is smash fascism. Just need to get rid of that shit. Um, who, uh, go out there and start your own culture, start a band, start a fanzine, start a podcast. If you must start a YouTube channel, start a Twitch stream. There's a lot of places to do shit like that, you know, but it doesn't have to be that bullshit. You can just draw a picture, you know, you could draw some, uh, pictures, photocopy them onto sticker paper and stick them around the city. You know, you can do that. You could, you could, you know, but it'll make you feel better to kind of do something creative and you know, put yourself out there. You don't even have to put yourself out there. Just do something creative for yourself, you know? And speaking of feeling better, maybe meditating will help. I try it, and it works for me a little bit, so maybe it'll work for you a little bit, and we can all slowly get better, you know? That's the hope. That is the hope. Um, and uh, sign your organ donor cards, because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't fucking need them. Just take that shit out of your body and do something else with it. And that's it. Stay safe. Uh, get your shots so we can all hang out again soon. I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait to give people hugs. All right. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.